So today we'll be welcoming six speakers that will share their, that have different walks of life and different perspectives on the word community. It's my pleasure to welcome our first speaker, founder of My Byword Office, Eric McRae. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to Maxine, Amber, and all the Creative Morning teams. They've been doing this for five years, so a big round of applause, and thank you for getting us all together. Ah, oh, got to get rid of that picture. <laughs> so I'm Eric McRae. I'm the founder of My Byword Office. Uh, it's a co-working incubator. And uh, part of the reasons I think that I'm here today is because I started and built out a community over the last three years of creative entrepreneurs. Uh, creative entrepreneurs are people who are really like-minded. They have, uh, like all of you here today, designers, developers, writers, uh, engineers, and people of all different walks of life who come together in a common interest. So I wanted to start off uh, the talk today by talk defining a little bit the difference between what a community and an audience is. Uh, very often when we talk about communities, we talk about online communities. Who in the room has heard of an online community? How many people believe in online communities? Awesome. I'm hoping to change all of your minds. <laughs> um, when you look at the definition for what an audience is, um, an audience is something where people are observing and interacting with an individual on a stage, like myself. Uh, they are not fully engaged. And I think that is one of the key differentiators between what an audience is and what a community is. So if we look at a community, it's a group of people uh, who live and exist in a similar place and have a combined set of interests and goals. It doesn't mean that they're all the same, and that's a very important distinction. People can have a common interest. We may all like knitting, but it doesn't mean that we are all the same individuals or cut from the same cloth, if you can excuse a pun. Uh, so we want to also talk about um, what are the characteristics uh, that make up a great community. So when we talk about the characteristics of a community, we think of um, their, uh, the likes, the dislikes, how we engage with those individuals. And one of the things I'm going to talk a little bit about towards the end is just how do we actually go about building that community. And, you know, I think it's important to define what it is that we look for when building communities. Uh, the first thing that we have to do, super important, is being deliberate about the things that we want to actually get from that community. Uh, individually, we can, any of us are empowered and are able to start communities now. We can do them online. We can connect with people. We can use social media. We can use meetups and groups and all these wonderful tools and resources uh, that we have today and I've always had, uh, but making sure that you're actually very specific and deliberate about what it is that you want to do. Um, creating a very simple set of vision and values that everyone can relate to. These are things that are, individually, we can all define. Uh, but you cannot and cannot be everything to everyone. If you're going to have a community, be specific about what it is that you want to do. Um, and understand, like for myself, when I think of my co-working community, which is, like I said, creative entrepreneurs who get together, we share resources. Um, but there's also a certain kind of person that comes to my space. Um, most of them dress and look like me. <laughs> they, they're coming in t-shirts and jeans and running shoes. And some people come in and they're like, oh, you know, like, what are you guys doing here? However, they're all professionals in what they do. They all have 10, 15 years worth of experience. They're all, all exceptional and amazing at what they do in their individual crafts. And that, for me, was a very important thing when I was defining what my community was and how I was going to engage and how I wanted them to interact and connect with each other. Uh, so when we also talk about... Um, how do we accept? And I'm at 30 seconds. So except, um, and we, another important part of the community is also understanding, and Amber, phone locked. <laughs> Sorry, thanks, thanks, Max. Oh, it's on? Oh. 
Um, and another very important part um, is understanding that the, um, not everyone is going to be a part of it. I get people who come into my office, and if you're coming in in a suit and tie, and you're going to be the business guy, you probably won't fit. And it's okay, because everyone has a space and a place where they belong, and it works, and it fits for what they do, and what their general interests are. And this is kind of my sniff test. <laughs> when you think of communities and you look at them from the perspective of you can connect with people digitally, but if you want to build community, you have to do it in an analog. A demonstration of that is today. We're all here, we're all connecting, we're all networking, we're all together. Uh, but that's where it really happens is when we can get face to face, shake the person's hand, and actually get a sense of what they smell like. And that's really key to building a strong community. That's my time. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. And now to speak to us about the power of food and community, Alyssa Campbell. Good morning. Um, you may think from these photos that the best part of my job is the food. <laughs> and I think that Simon, our chef and kitchen manager, would be a little bit miffed if I didn't say that wasn't true, at least some of the time. But the reality is the best part of my job is the people that I meet, um, especially on Wednesdays when, after our cooking workshop, we sit together to eat lunch. And that simple gathering, that half an hour of time, it never ceases to make me pause for thought. And that's because the diversity of people that sit at that table is absolutely astounding. I don't know anywhere else in Ottawa where as diverse a group of people come together to have lunch. When we first started cooking workshops um, several years ago, we were still kind of stuck in that old food bank mentality. And we thought, we are going to teach people how to cook. And we quickly realized that a mom who's raised six kids in the South Sudan she knows how to cook. In fact, she could probably teach us a thing or two. What she really wanted, what she really needed, were people, friends, to eat with. Social isolation may be exacerbated by poverty, but ironically, it's an affliction that unites many of us. 60% you know, of us say uh, that we usually eat lunch alone, but the same percentage of people say that eating lunch with their colleagues makes their days more enjoyable. And we're right. A study released this year from Oxford University showed that eating in solitude is more strongly associated with uh, unhappiness than any single factor other than mental illness. Social isolation, that feeling of not being connected to other people, may be one of the most debilitating ailments of our time. Um, Karen, our director, likes to tell the story of a uh, an elderly woman who was coming to cooking workshops several years ago quite regularly. And one day, over lunch, she leaned over and whispered, Karen, I'm not poor. I'm just lonely. We tell that story because it reminds us that she may not have been um, struggling financially, but she was impoverished by her community and her lack of connection to the people who lived there. When you live in poverty, the impacts of social isolation are all the more crippling. The lack of support systems and poor mental health that come with isolation and loneliness um, make it really difficult to escape cycles of poverty and poor health. <laughs> Strong social networks are a critical part of the path out of poverty. But equally important are diverse social networks. We tend to spend time with people who are like us. Think of your own social circles. The cultural background, economic bracket, beliefs of the people that you spend time with. We spend time with people who are like us because that's what's most comfortable. Um, just... <laughs> Oftentimes, our institutions uh, designed to help us socialize, they reinforce that habit by dividing us along income lines. So in our neighborhood, we have an after-school program exclusively for low-income kids, 
and then we have a tennis club that has high membership fees and a dress code. And the result is that we really struggle to connect with people who are different than us. Every Monday, we have um, groups of kids that come to the Parkdale Food Center for workshops on how to become a solutionary. And a big part of those workshops is about the importance of getting to know, getting to know your neighbors and your neighborhood. Um, in the third workshop, we ask the kids to write down on a card things that they've noticed in their neighborhood that really strike them. And one 10-year-old's card has been hanging in our office on the wall since last November. She wrote, in my neighborhood, most people don't know how to deal with different ideas. I think one of the most important aspects of the Parkdale Food Center is that it breaks that trend by creating a space for everybody. On Wednesdays at lunch, I have no idea who I'm going to sit beside. Last week, I sat beside a retired actuary and we shared our secret love of math. <laughs> the week before, I sat beside an elderly woman with a beautiful Caribbean accent who'd been living in our neighborhood for the past 40 years. Sometimes I sit beside an eight-year-old. Sometimes I sit beside someone who's struggling with mental health and addiction. As a result of working at PFC, I can nod a friendly hello to nearly half of the people that I pass on the street on my 20-minute walk home in the evening. Imagine what that would mean for your commute. In my line of work, we often ask ourselves, how do we get to a place where food banks aren't needed anymore? And I think at least part of the answer is by getting people to sit around a table together. If we can, get, if we can create spaces where people get out of their comfort zone, get to know their, their neighbors, and share a meal with someone who's different than them, then that's part of the way to a place where food banks aren't needed anymore. Because one, it, it leads to better human understanding and empathy. And two, because it leads to a sense of belonging and community that allows people to imagine and pursue new possibilities. Thank you. Euh, C'est mon plaisir d'inviter Cindy Savard du Pressoir euh, à vous parler on the subject of uh, bilingualism in Ottawa. Oh wow, that's a lot of people. So hi everyone, I feel uh, really privileged to be here this morning, thanks to Creative Mornings. I feel even more privileged to be here because I'm the only francophone among, among the, all the speakers this morning. And I'm, I, and I'm here. <laughs> and I'm here today to speak about my community that I serve, that I feel that I serve. And I came here five years ago to study at U Ottawa to do my teachers to, to get my teacher's college degree, which I now have. And I was really sure I was going to go back to Montreal afterwards, because Ottawa was known as the city that the fun forgot. And <laughs> I'm passionate about cultural events, and I'm, I, I was all in in Montreal. And once I got here, I scraped the web because I was curious to know what was happening here. And oh my God, there was so many things that was happening here, so many opportunities to do activities, cultural activities. And then I decided to, to do something about it, to serve my community, to serve the cultural events uh, mission. And I built Sousol 809, that was the first thing that I did, and I decided to stay here. And I, I, I thought I felt that I had a mission to fulfill, because the big media weren't really promoting these events. So then I got a collaboration with Apartment 613, I was their francophone branch, and it worked really, really well. And I had the chance to work for the first time with an anglophone organization and it was great and I'm now working with Anglophones every day and it's another culture that I, I didn't get the chance to meet before and this is amazing to commute together for, and for the first time in my life I had to discover a new culture and it was just beside me so then a few years ago I mean nine weeks ago I just launched Le Pressoir with two other colleagues and it's a bigger media now, it's a francophone media. 
And every week we send to our subscribers a newsletter. Where's the newsletter? Da -da -da. No, I don't have the newsletter, but <laughs> well, you have to subscribe to see what <laughs> the newsletter <laughs> looks, looks like. So every week, every Monday, we send a list of events, cultural activities you all can do in the area. It's, we cover both Ottawa and Gatineau region. It's something great, and the first mission is to provide Francophone with cultural activities. There is a second mission, and I'm going to tell you about it in the next minutes. A bit of storytelling. I just came back from a trip to Europe. I crossed by bike four countries. I started in Germany, ended up in uh, Hungary. And every, all my life I was told that English was the language to learn, was the international language, but I couldn't use any of my English in these four countries that I crossed. I used French. That was really helpful. And that made me reflect. I came back and I was like, oh my God, we're so lucky in Canada to have these two official cultures, these two official languages that we can use. Especially in Ottawa and Gatineau, we live with each other every day. We commute, we use the bridges, there are four bridges. Why not build a fifth one and just a virtual one and meet together and get interest in the other culture? The first time that I went to a theater play in English, it was at the Gladstone Theater. It was a new thing. I'm passionate about theater. The wording, the way to do things, the way to express things is so different, and I wish everyone here to be able to go and do the same thing in the other language. I'm teaching French as a, te as a second language in a high school um, at Glebe, in the Glebe, and all my students and parents of my students are all like, oh yeah, we're so shy. I know you all here can speak and understand a bit of French. I'm super sure about that. And the thing is, and I understand that, everyone is a little bit shy, and this is normal. I'm shy too, but this morning, I'm taking the microphone, speaking to you in English, my second language. So I think we can all open our mind to uh, the idea of commuting together to build that fifth bridge. And my double mission is to attract your interest and attention to Le Pressoir. This is the first thing you can do, maybe. Tell your children, tell your friends, tell your relatives that exist. Come to our side of the river. Get to know, um, even in Ottawa, there are so many francophone activities that happens every day. There are more than 200 activities, cultural activities in the area, both sides of the, of the river. It's, it's an amazing city to live. So help me making, uh, spreading the word that Ottawa isn't the city that the fun forgot. And I'm going to end with, a, with lyrics from a singer. She's, uh, she's uh, from Montreal. Her name is Ariane Moffat. You probably know about her, maybe. And these lyrics are, L'ouverture de l'esprit n'est pas une fracture du crâne. For those who understood, uh, this is my point I wanted to make this morning. And for those who didn't get it, come and see me. I'm going to be really happy to help you out with that. <laughs> and that's it, le pressoir. And join. All right, um, I'm really excited to welcome Megan Isaacs to the stage. She's co-founder of Girls Plus Skate 613. Um, so my name is Meg, and I care a lot about skateboarding, which is still something that's surprising for me to say because skateboarding did not care a lot about me. Um, I was about 12 years old when I picked it up, and I quit pretty shortly after because I didn't see myself in skateboarding. I didn't know of any girls, or certainly adult women, who are still doing it. And I think subconsciously, I just didn't think it was something I could be good at because I didn't see it. Am I too loud to lean? Too close. Up. <laughs> so about a decade later, skateboarding came into my life again and I met a group of beautiful weirdos that were always skating and causing a ruckus in my neighborhood in Centertown. And they started inviting me out, and I quickly started to see that this was more than just a group of people who had skateboarding in common. This was 
people who supported each other. And we supported each other in other areas of our lives outside of skateboarding. Um, we helped each other put together art shows. We opened skate shops. We started two or three not-for-profits. And we ended up actually hustling the city to get a skate park built in the downtown core, finally. And after that, we even got it named after our friend Charlie, who passed away. So I was quickly starting to see what we could do as a community. And it allowed me to grow not even my own confidence, but to know that as a group of people, we could create change and we could impact the city of Ottawa and our city's culture. So this gang of strange misfits that I was hanging around with told me about this night that was starting up at McNabb indoors called Girls Only Sessions. And when I went to that, it was like the missing piece for me. Because I finally saw myself in skateboarding and I was meeting people like me and they were afraid to try it too, but we were all encouraging of each other and wanted each other to succeed. And since then, it's developed into something way more than what I could have imagined, I think any of us could have, and it's still evolving. The first couple years were incredible, and then everything changed. Um, we got an outdoor park, and when we got an outdoor park, they closed our indoor park at McNabb. So what this meant was we went from an indoor space where everyone felt pretty comfortable to being forced outside in a public space where everyone could see us fall. And I've done it many times, but it sucks to eat shit in front of a bunch of people. <laughs> it's not fun. But when you have a group of people who support you, you've got five hands right away picking you back up. Do you need a hug? Do you want a Band-Aid? It's totally different than the experience I had at 12 when I started out. And so we needed to reflect on that because if we were moving outside, we needed to keep our programming accessible. We didn't want people scared off because they were gonna eat it outside in front of people and never wanna come back. So we took a look at that, and we took a look at the fact that the people coming to our sessions, they weren't girls only, like our name implied. They were folks from diverse identities of all ages who had found a place that they belonged on Thursdays. So yes, it was skateboarding, but it was so much more than that, and we needed to evolve to reflect that. So that summer, we changed our name, our logo, our brand identity, and we made it clear to everyone that our skate sessions weren't for girls only. It's for anyone that wanted a space to learn and be encouraged to learn and make mistakes. So this was only able to happen because we were open to that change. And none of us wanted to create barriers in skateboarding the way that there were barriers for us when we started. And I think what that comes down to when you're looking to build a community and evolve is opportunity. There weren't the same opportunities for me in skateboarding that there were for my guy friends. And opportunity is something that you really shouldn't take for granted. I've spent a lot, a lot, a lot of time over the years explaining to people the subtle, and not so subtle, forms of exclusion that exist for women, for girls, for queer and trans folks, for people of marginalized identities that don't fit into the white boys club that the skate industry caters to. So it was time for change. And sure, you'll lose some people along the way who might not understand what you're doing to grow with your community and evolve, but communities are not static. They never have been and they never will be. They're always changing, and they're always evolving. And there's nothing but good that can come from creating room for that growth. What we have now as a result of that is an inclusive space for everyone, all ages, all identities, and all abilities. Slide. <laughs> so our ever-growing and evolving community can be found on Thursday nights at Charlie Bowen Skate Park in the downtown core. And if you come check us out sometime, you might find a home in skateboarding the way that I did. Thank you. Such a good job.
Thanks, Meg. That was awesome. So please help me in welcoming a community leader who is both Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee. Did I say that right? I hope so. Well, he'll teach me. Thank you. Uh, David Garo. The mic stand? Yeah. I'm going to have to use the, uh, my index cards because I'm not quite good at remembering things as the other speakers. <laughs> and if I didn't, I'd probably rant on for like longer than 10 o'clock. So. Um, so thank you, Maxine. Um, my name is David Garrow. It is a pleasure to be here, and I thank you all for welcoming me here. And I just wanted to quickly say thank you to the Algonquin Nation for, uh, welcoming, for, welcome, for welcoming us and providing a safe passage on their unceded territory. Um, obviously, as you can tell, our theme is on community. Um, the moment that defined the idea of community for me happened when I opened a classroom door when I was 12 years old. But to make sense of that moment, I must provide a bit of a, my family background. My mom was born and raised in a small First Nation called Sagamark. She grew up with nine sisters and three brothers. The kids grew up collecting berries and working with the garden. My mom's job was walking a few kilometers every day with a pail to get water for the family from the local well. This is a great example of the incredible work ethic we all know my mom to have through her education and government career. My father was born in Agwasasne, raised in was born in Agwasasne and raised in Agwasasne in Buffalo, New York, with his three brothers. He developed his lifelong sense of morals and ethics serving the United States Air Force. He would go on to work in Indigenous Affairs and consulting. I'm just gonna... and they met in 1969 here in Ottawa. Together they raised five boys. I am the youngest. I'll just pause here and let all the collective parents uh, <laughs> collectively moan, oh, that poor mother. <laughs> that ancestry makes my brothers and I Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe, an English that's Mohawk and Ojibwe, or Ojibwak, as you can see on my shirt, and as we amusingly like to say. My parents lived in various parts of Ontario, but most of us were raised in Peterborough. As you know, Peterborough was a very Catholic and Caucasian city. I grew up knowing my family was proudly Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe, but we, I knew we were different from everyone else. And we did face some discrimination, like everywhere. But for the most part, we were welcomed there. We still have lifelong friends in Peterborough, and we try to return as much as possible. As you can see, there were a lot of elements in my life shaping my sense of community. My mom and dad is different First Nations the Canadian and American cultures that surrounded them, my dad's military background, and Ontario's small city life. But I never really thought about the notion of community until that day we moved to Ottawa and I first opened my first classroom door at Fisher Park Junior High, just over on Holland Avenue. All my life I had been that one non-Caucasian in my Peterborough classroom. At Fisher, I encountered my first culture shock, if you will. I suddenly found myself in a mini UN my classmates were Canadians with ancestry from Vietnam, Somalia, Japan, England, France, Nigeria, China, Jamaica, and Kuwait. And I could still see all their beautiful faces when I first opened that door. And what we had in common was that we, were, we all had great grandparents, grandparents, and parents that persevered who decided that they were going to make their lives here. At some point, 2, 20, or 2, 10, or 50 years ago, someone had chosen to leave their home and move to a place where their kid could have a better future than they had. They weren't born into community, they chose one. You don't have to inherit your community, you can build it. That experience defined my sense of community and to a large degree, my life. Currently I work for one of Canada's leading indigenous consulting firms, Envision Insight Group. I love working there because we've chosen specifically to work with and for Indigenous peoples and communities. We recently launched a series of Indigenous culture awareness courses for companies, departments, students, and just individuals 
who want to understand what reconciliation really means. My latest passion is volunteering. As an ambassador and mentor for a group named Ap called Apathy is Boring, it's a youth-led organization that works to educate and support young people to be active citizens in their community. The RISE program that I'm a part of just recently con conducted three social inclusion workshops throughout Ottawa just this past spring. It's completely youth-led, and again, the message we're driving home is the same. You don't inherit your community, you create it. I'm still learning from and building my community, and hopefully that process will never stop. My Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe roots are a huge part of who I am. And I'll always probably nurture that part of myself. But I've also chosen to define myself as part of a larger community. One that accepts people, regardless of their skin color, politics, religion, gender, age, sexuality, or all those other borders that separate us from them. Community is wherever our neighbors, friends, and family are. We seem to be at a defining moment with a lot of powerful voices in the wind looking to divide us and turn us against each other to take away our connection to community. And for those people who believe that we're born and locked into one group, that can be a seductive message. But to the voices that would push us back behind our walls, I say, not on my watch. I will not choose fear. Instead, I choose forgiveness. I will not choose anger. Instead, I choose laughter and love. And I will not choose to live within the boundaries someone else chooses to define as a way to exclude others from our community. The community I choose is going right into that Fisher Park classroom and embracing what's there. I choose my yearly secret Santa parties with my friends from junior high. I choose storytelling with my friends and family at get-togethers throughout all this city and back in our communities. I choose the awesomeness of a St. Patrick's Day party hosted by three Canadian brothers from Nigeria here in the south end of Ottawa. <laughs> I choose my niece's naming ceremony in Nepean. I choose that learning from volunteering that apathy is in fact boring. I choose listening to our elders whether they're from Aquasasne, Renfrew, or Somalia. I choose having a coffee and a handshake with someone with opposing views rather than a social media argument. I choose the community that gives an Ojibhawk voice, a voice to speak out. I choose sharing whatever version of this land we so make it to be. And lastly, I choose to build community. What type of community do you choose? Miigwech and thank you. Okay, last but certainly not least, um, I'd like to invite Little Miss Ottawa, Julie Weber, to the stage. Hi everyone, my name's Julia Weber and I'm from Little Miss Ottawa. It's an Instagram account that I started four years ago as a way to challenge myself to get out and explore more of Ottawa instead of always waiting for my next international adventure. It's a passion project that's grown in a way I never could have imagined and it's introduced me to so many amazing communities in the city from Instagrammers, musicians, foodies, makers, and more. And I think sometimes it's easy to overlook your hometown and take it for granted. I'm certainly not a stranger to that, but when I travel now and I see other cities doing things differently, I see that as an opportunity to come back and create and create a community around it. So it's an opportunity and not a weakness. And I'm proud to be a part of a lot of communities in Ottawa and I think they make us so much stronger. So I asked Instagram, what does community mean to you? And they said, belonging, energizing each other, fun and inclusion, gatherings with tasty food, feeling like I can make an impact in my town, and support and togetherness. So I think community can mean all of these things. But for me, the secret equation... Oh, okay. oh oops. <laughs> I haven't used this before. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, so community equals experience plus connection. Anytime that you can experience something with people and also have a connection, it's gonna make everything so much stronger. 
And the glue that holds all this together is passion. Passion's contagious. It's what keeps us there when things are hard. And we're also able to connect with people on a deeper level. So really quickly, 10 seconds, I want you to turn to someone around you, hopefully someone you don't know, and share your passion with them. So one, two, three, go. Okay. <laughs> Keep going. Okay. All right. So I hope that you learned something cool about your neighbor and hopefully sharing your passion, you're able to connect with them. <laughs> Back here. <laughs> Icebreaker. So not only do communities help you connect on that deeper level, share your passions, experience things with other people, but there's also two huge benefits. So the World Health Organization recognizes this, the social support of communities as something that positively affects our health over the course of our life. And Harvard did a 75 year study on what's the factor that makes us the happiest throughout our lives and it's relationships. So as we get older, our interests develop more. We're able to find like-minded individuals. We're able to find people that share the same passions as us. And if we're building communities around that, imagine the strength of the relationships within that community and then in turn the happiness that it's creating for you. But where do you find communities? Well, you're sitting in one huge one today. Creative Mornings is an amazing community of like-minded people. You come here to get inspired. You come here to connect with people. So this is a great starting place. But social media is also an amazing tool for finding people. You can put a status out today on something you're passionate about and people who share that same passion, they'll respond to it. And similar to how I put what I was passionate about out on Instagram. And even if you look at your Facebook feed, there's Facebook events that are coming into it every day. And those are open invitations from communities to get you to join. And you might think, maybe I don't have the skills, I don't know anybody. And I certainly didn't when I first started. I started my Instagram account with my iPhone and then I learned photography. But I met people in the Instagram community through meetups and they welcomed me with open arms. They were so willing to teach me things and I've created really great friendships from that. So it's also important to note that you can start on social media, but you need to take it offline. You need to meet with people in person and really build those experiences, build those connections. And the more active you are in the community, the more you're gonna get from it. And I can guarantee everything that you put into it, you're gonna receive back tenfold. So what are the next steps? Well, anytime you can create a community around something, whether for personal or for business, it's gonna make everything so much stronger. And my whole goal with Little Miss Ottawa is to encourage people to get out there and explore. So I challenge you today to get out there and explore, explore new passions, whether existing or new, connect with new people, really put yourself out there and get loud about things. And you never know where your next community might lead you. And it might have started in this room today when you shared your passion with someone just a few moments ago. Thank you.